Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll profile Moorhead, Minnesota filmmaker Raymond Rea. But first, our guest is a retired dean at NDSU who is now an author of a book, We Are Called to Do the Right Thing, Prakash Matthew. Thanks for joining us today, sir. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Right. As we get started, we always ask, tell the folks a little bit about yourself and your background, maybe where you're originally from. Okay. I grew up in India, southern part of India, in one of the smallest states that's very, in a coastal area, that's where I grew up. I was there in that particular state for about 16 years, and then I went to college in the northern part of India, and a Christian college, a small college, but it's an agriculture college. And, uh, uh, and then I came here after that in 1971. So it's exactly 50 years ago that I came to North Dakota. And there's a great story about that, and we can talk about that when, if the time allows. But we, I came here and uh, came here for graduate school uh, at North Dakota State University and uh, completed that. And uh, soon after I completed that, and uh, I was offered a position uh, and then moved up in the ladder. I have had, a, I used to joke about that and say to people that I started mopping the floor all the way to the vice presidency. I think I uh, uh, ended my career as the vice president for student affairs at the North Dakota State University. After retirement, uh, about a week prior, no, no, not even week, three days prior to my retirement, uh, I got a call from the president and asked me to step in as the athletic director uh, when uh, Gene Taylor left uh, uh, here and uh, I, was, I did that job for about six months. So long career, uh, higher education, uh, 38 years, at NDSU, 34 years, and uh, if I were to count my student days, it is a lot more than that. Well, well, of course, you're here today to really talk about the book, We Are Called to Do the Right Thing. So we're going to get to that in just a few minutes. But before we do, you mentioned your journey to Fargo was quite, I thought, unexpected back in 1970, 71. And uh, I guess, uh, in, well, what I understand, it changed your life. Can you tell us about that? Absolutely. That's a, it's an amazing story. It's an amazing story. And a uh, uh, few blocks from here, there's a church called the First Presbyterian Church. And the pastor of the church, uh, his name was um, Reverend Ross Robson. He came along with a team to visit India. And one of the universities they selected happened to be the college that I was going to at that time. And uh, so the president of the college selected half a dozen students to meet with this team of people from the United States. And uh, I was paired up with, I was one of the students who got selected to meet with this team from the U.S. And I was paired up with uh, Ross Robson from Fargo, North Dakota. Mm -hmm. We had, we spent the whole day together. He had all kinds of questions he was learning about the culture, the political system, the educational system, uh, you name it. And uh, during that time, I can remember only one question, probably alluded, he asked me where I want to go to, where I'm thinking about going for graduate school. I said, I never thought about that, and uh, uh, my do my graduate work, chances are it'll be in, the, in, the, in India. Uh, that was the end of the conversation. He said, then later before he said goodbye to me, he said, if you get an opportunity to study abroad, would you be interested? I said, I'm, I'm sure I will be, but I never thought about that. That was the end of the conversation. My advisor, this is a very unique college, is a private college, and uh, uh, my professors were from abroad. In fact, my advisor was uh, Dr. James Warner from British Columbia. Uh, from uh, that was he was not an Indian. Uh, uh, so. Ron Robson has been, he was working with uh, my advisor, and for whatever reason, we fell in love with each other. And he said, he made the decision at that moment that he wanted to bring me here. But he never told me anything about this. He worked through my advisor, and then the, he came there in 1968. Uh, this visit was in 1968. So he kept it quiet until 1970. 1970 disclosed to me that we have been making plans. And he came back here and talked to the people in the church. They have been praying about it. They bring them, we are going to bring this man. Uh, and uh, I was a young boy, and, or a young, youngster, at least. Uh, uh, the, he was going to bring me here. And uh, 70, 1970, he disclosed that to me. And uh, he sent me three applications uh, for three universities. 
One of them happened to be North Dakota State University. I got admitted to all three universities, and when I told Ross that uh, I got admitted to all three places, where do I go to school? And he said, I, was, I just did that just for fun. I just wanted to see how good you are, <laughs> how good you are, if you can get admitted to all three places. And since I'm here, you are, of course, you're coming to North Dakota State University. So I came here, 1971, 1971. And uh, uh, how this all happened, it was impossible to explain. And in the book, I say it, it was definitely God's plan. It was God's plan. Well, mm -hmm. with that said, let's talk about your book. Yeah. Uh, your book has various chapters. Yes. And we're going to talk about a, a few of them here. L let's start with upholding values as guiding principles. Yep. And what that means. Mm -hmm. Well, I strongly believe that uh, we all talk about the values. Values. For mine, uh, the, the guiding principles come from my values. Where do we get our values? Start with, the, I think the, the book starts with talking about where do we get our values? I think most of my, I, I can uh, look back and say that majority of the values were instilled to me by my parents, my parents. And then as we grow older, we get some of them from the schools, the teachers and the society, and uh, we develop values during the process. But for me, my parents were my heroes, particularly my dad. He was an outstanding leader, outstanding leader. He was a pastor in the, uh, the for, for 40, 40 years. But at the same time, he was much more than that. He was much more. He was a servant leader. He was a servant leader, an inspirational leader, an outstanding speaker. But he was my hero. The reason for being he was a hero was he practiced what he preached. Everything about servant leadership, Everything about the values I learned from my dad. I'm my dad. My dad also had the opportunity to work side by side with Mahatma Gandhi. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is before he went to the ministry, ministry. He was one of the very, very few Christians worked with him on the side and during the independence movement. And because you know that India is a country where 85% are Hindus, about 10% are Islam, and only 3% are Christians. And he was a Christian pastor. At that time, he was not a pastor. He was one of the very few Christians who worked side by side with him. So values. So in the early stage, we all talk about the values. And but at the same time, we, if somebody asks you, okay, what, what are your values? Well, we know there are certain things and we shoot from the hip as to, we know there are certain things that are important to me. So one of the things I encourage in the book is how people identify their core values. So when they make the decisions, later we can talk about the decision-making process, and they can reach back and say that, whether that is 80-20 principle, which I think I really talk about there in the book. And then they can reach back and say, these are the values that I'm not going to sacrifice in my decision-making process. And maybe I might dig deeper into it and say that, dig my heels there in some of those. And that can be good or bad uh, and in some organizations. So that's what I'm talking about as the values, the core values that become your principles and value. Yeah, well, uh, discuss practicing what is the 80-20 principle. Uh, principle, yeah, okay. you mentioned that. Well, that's what the reason that I originally talked because uh, in uh, somewhere in the early 90s, I developed this principle. This is my own original. I think uh, uh, I left here, North Dakota State University and worked in Mankato State University. During that period, I felt that there was some struggle deep within me that uh, the values of the institution wasn't not 100 percent. You're never going to find 100 percent match. But it was, I wasn't 100 percent sure it was the right fit. Great university, great people. And I was in the uh, upper level position where I could have changed all that and made everybody else miserable and say, OK, this is the way to th do things, which I didn't do that. And, uh, but I was somewhat struggling. That was the time that I started thinking deeper into it. And how do you know that you're the right fit for an organization? That's what 8020 is all about. So my principal talked about if your personal values come in conflict with the institutional values, or organizational values, more than 20% of the time, you are in a discomfort zone or a void zone, and you go home somewhat stressed out. Not somewhat. Some, uh, and if particularly if the organization and if that conflict is happening 
consistently and more than 20 percent time, you, that is not the right fit for you. And so you need to do something about it. So the book talks about how, what can you do in the front end when you are looking for a job, majority, particularly when you're looking for the first job, or you lost a job and you're looking for a second job based because you don't have a job, then what happens is you want a job so bad, you will sacrifice your values. You will do all your preparation based on your skills, knowledge, and experience. And uh, same way, the employers are looking for, not necessarily looking for the right fit, they are looking for the skills and knowledge, we want the right person, but not necessarily anything about, very few questions maybe about who you are as a person. Okay, that's where that conflict is going to really going to come from. Majority of the time you, uh, you go through interviews, 90% of the questions are about skills and knowledge, right? And uh, so I talk about in this book, uh, encouraging people to find out what the organization is all about and their values, their mission statement, and then find out as to if they are really practicing what they say who they are. And, uh, and in fact, I can talk about examples at NDSU. Mm -hmm. When they come and uh, interview with me, and lots of employees, they will come and they'll, so I ask them, uh, why do you want to work here? And uh, what prompted you to apply for a job here? And they will say, oh, I already missed I'm so inspired. I'm so inspired because this is the right place for me. Because I love what you say in your mission statement and mission statement. And I said, well, give me an example. They will say that uh, your institution says students are number one, students are paramount, and uh, you are a student-focused land-grant research institution. And I said, yeah, uh, that's, who we, that's who we are. So how do you know that? How do you know that we are practicing that? How do you know you're practicing that? Because I'm in student affairs area, so I know I want to believe that we are, so, but you are coming as a new employee, how do you know that you are, uh, we are doing that? So I send them out to, I give them one hour during the interview process. I send them to the student union and say, you find six to eight students, talk to them, talk to them, and mm -hmm. interview them and come back and tell me that if they are feeling they are number one at this institution. And if they come, and you come back and tell me, report back to me, and the bad news, give me the bad news and say that, and the majority of the students, they don't even know what the heck you're talking about. <laughs> and then, it is a different story. Then we, that means we are not practicing what we are preaching. Yeah. So that's what it's all about, yeah. right fit. But, and you mentioned the decision maker, and I, I wanna get through some of these chapters. Mm -hmm. What about being a decision maker? You, you talked about that yeah. briefly. Um, we all make this, some people make the decision, some people sit on it, and even the 80-20 principle applies that also. Mm -hmm. One of, the, uh, one of the chapters I think I talk about supervision aspect of one of the frustrations a lot of the employees may have, may have is the, everything get bottlenecked. And they will say, oh, we have to talk to my supervisor, my supervisor, supervisor, I'm waiting for an answer. So they cannot make the decision uh, and, uh, or, or they are not empowered to make the decision. So one of the suggestions I make is every employee, every employee should have uh, authority is not the right word, responsibility to make, 80% of the things identified in the job description. So if I'm hiring somebody, I'm going to say that this is what I'm looking for, this, these are the qualities I'm looking for, and I hire somebody and bring them there, and then they don't get any responsibility to make the decision, then why did we want that person to be there? So I say to them, uh, all the employees, there was one time that I oversaw about 400 some employees. And uh, so I went to a staff meeting, I told them, take a look at your job description. If you are not making 80% of the things identify in your job description, that means we are not putting you to use. And their supervisors were listening to that, coming to. So that means if they do that, then there won't be only 20% that they need to get help from. Out of that uh, 20%, 10% of that is all still, we, there may be a coaching taking place between the supervisor and that employee. So that leaves with only 10%. And very little, uh, so uh, again, empowering the employees to have responsibility for certain things and they can make the decision. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's go to another one, you know, to, to your title, yeah. to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Sounds 
pretty general. But can, you, can you explain that chapter real quick in your book? Yes, I think that's an area where I was also struggling with. I think there are three principles I give about making the right decision. And uh, number one, we all know what is right and wrong. And uh, I talked about the values developing in the early stage and the children know my, my oldest son, the first word that he ever spoke was not dad or mom. He said hot, the word hot. That means he knew you know, you're not supposed to touch a stove, that's going to be hot. So we learn in a young age that what is right and wrong. Number two principle is uh, it has to do with legal or illegal. So we know what is law guiding us. Number, number three is doing the right thing for the right reason. And uh, majority of the time, that means for most people, it's a gut feeling. You may be doing the first and two things right, but when it comes to third factor, you are making a certain decision based on your gut. Gut decisions are not always right because you're influenced by other people it is based, gut decisions are based on the perceptions. And that is not your value because you want to make a popular decision because that's what other people want you to do and you want to be popular in other ways. So what happens is you make the third factor is that that's the reason why I wrote the book and said, put that, give that title and I put an essay out to people and I gave them three questions to people across the nation, six people I selected and asked them to identify what is doing the right thing for the right reason? What is doing the right thing for the wrong reason? What is doing the wrong thing for the right reason? Come back and tell me and what that is all about. There's a chapter from a perspective from six different people. And I also give a, start that chapter with a failure that I had. And it's a powerful story that I went to India, took my children and I failed miserably. And I'm so not a success story. And, uh, so, and that's how I start, start that chapter and giving them some, some uh, template as to how do you make the right decision for the right reason. Mm. You've got other chapters in the book. I don't know if you have any you want to highlight in general, but I, I've got one in there. You, you talked about your dad being a, a servant leader yeah. and you've got a chapter about to be a servant. What's yeah. that one about? Well, I think again, in the beginning, I mentioned about my dad is my hero, my, and he had the opportunity to work with Gandhi. Yeah. Uh, Gandhi is not my hero. I think I, I respect him and my dad is mine because, because he modeled his behavior for, he was a servant leader. Serving others was the number one priority in his life. So when I came here and started working in higher education, I tried to instill that philosophy in my leadership in my management, and uh, I never liked people calling me boss. I never called it. And I wanted to be a servant leader. And uh, so who did I serve? The students. I learned from the students, students. And they were my love, they were my love. And uh, so the litmus test was, if the students would testify and say that he was here to serve us, and he did his job well, and if that's the testimony I'm gonna get, I'm, gr I'm grateful. That's what servant leadership is all about. Serving others comes number one. Everything that we do is serving other people. So what's been the reaction to the book so far? Overwhelming. I, d I thought maybe, uh, I thought there may be, uh, you know, a few people hear about it. The first signing process, it was at NDSU. There were 200 people stood in line to sign them. I was just uh, in tears. I think it was, I was overwhelmed. Zambros down the street here. Uh, there were about 60, 70 people were there. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to be at the DMF, Dakota Medical Foundation. They are hosting an event from two to four. So if people are, I'm also doing a presentation there at three o'clock. Mm -hmm. So it has been overwhelming. Okay. Well, we're about out of time. So if people want to get a copy of the book, where can they go? Uh, locally, they can get it in DSU Bookstore, in DSU, uh, in DSU Press, uh, Zambros down the street here. Uh, and Amazon uh, and some other major other book, bookstores, yes. Well, we thank you for taking your time and this is gonna be interesting to read. I ho hope Th you have success with it. Thank you, John, thank you. Thank right. you very much. Thank you for having me here. Stay tuned for more. Raymond Rea is a brilliant filmmaker who specializes in personal documentary and experimental movies also an instructor in the film studies program at Minnesota State University Moorhead, Ray's personal journey and his films are often intertwined. 
It's important to say that I'm a filmmaker first and a transgender filmmaker second. My venture into making movies was I had a best friend who lived two houses away from me in small town Massachusetts and she was given a Super 8 movie camera. She used to ride a unicycle so we ended up making like an epic Super 8 film about somebody riding a unicycle down a long driveway. I went to one summer semester at NYU in New York City, taking a cinematography class from a cinematography instructor named Bella Bakta. And I learned so much in that cinematography class. I swear I'm still using that information to this day. Third was really, I think, the first time I really started making films within the LGBTQ community. There was a third gender character and their girlfriend, so really sort of a lesbian couple in San Francisco. I had sort of a slow fade into being a trans man in the sense that, like many transgender people, especially from my era, I made a really valiant effort at first to like fit into the gender that was assigned to me at birth, and it just didn't work at all. At this point in my life, I've definitely lived more than half of my adult life as a man. I know I'm a trans person, but I don't, I guess I don't think about it that much. It's just me. I had so many friends come up to me and say, wow, we're not sure if this is right for everybody, but Ray, it's like obviously right for you. Looking across the body of his work, you start to see a lot of different aspects of his own life, uh, even when he's telling stories about other people in the LGBT community or personal docs about his family. You are a target. It's really fun to watch his projects as a whole. One of the pieces I really like is Cat's Cradle, which is an experimental animation project. And part of the reason I like it so much is the sound design in relation to the imagery because it's done in stop motion using a Xerox machine. It has just a really interesting aesthetic. The way that in general I describe my filmmaking is it always ends up being an experimental hybrid no matter what I try to do. As a filmmaker, he has kind of opened a window for students to see different kinds of work, to see a different life perspective. So that's your great uncle, looking very dapper, and I would say that's in the 50s. And all this stuff is This is in the Grove, clearly, these photographs. Crowds and crowds of young gay men. When my great uncle Wari died, my parents came to me and said, we've got this photo album of Wari's. Do you want it? And it ended up just being amazing. I think the photographs speak for themselves or at least that's what I tried to have happen in that film. How are you? Uh, I'm pretty good. I think that he's a very approachable uh, instructor um, as far as professors go. It's also really important that he shares his work as a filmmaker with students. Ray has done many things for our program and for our students. 
One of the things that I've seen is we have a more diverse student body because of his presence in the program. I just am so inspired uh, by young people getting into film. My ultimate advice to many students is after you graduate, you are not going to see a want ad in the paper for film director or cinematographer, you know. It is just not going to be there. You are going to have to be scrappy as hell. Well, that's all we have this week on Prairie Pulse. And as always, thanks for watching. Funded by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund with money from the vote of the people of Minnesota on November 4th, 2008. And by the members of Prairie Public.